Thank you, Kyle. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to see all of you wonderful minds focused on what is the future, not only of the United States of America, but of the region. And I believe that it will be the economic future of the world. Um, as Kyle mentioned, the United States Congress, we budget about a trillion dollars a year. But when I was the budget chairman in the state of California, the budget at that time was almost exactly a hundred billion dollars. But at that same time, when you look at the economy of California as a trillion dollar economy, so you can imagine what the unleashing of a, mil a trillion dollars in a budget of one country affects not only the GDP of our country, but impacts the entire world. And so as goes the United States, so goes the world when it comes to economics and when it comes to the health, financial health of many households throughout the world. Um, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me here today. In addition to that, I think it's important for us to understand that there are other people uh, besides Kyle who made this such a tremendous, wonderful event, and I'd like to thank them as well. Um, I'd like to also thank and acknowledge Joaquin Castro, who will be speaking later on, my colleague in Congress from Texas, and I'm jealous of him. Not only is he better looking, but Texas, even though they have a smaller economy, they do a much, much better job at doing trade with the country south of us. And that's something that I don't want to be jealous of for very long, and I want to make sure that he says that of California, and hopefully of me. Not the looks, of course. Uh, that that, that uh, we'll, we'll never overcome. Uh, I also want to recognize the honorary chairs, uh, Nobel laureates Oscar Arias, and the former president, of, who's a former president of Costa Rica, and also want to uh, thank uh, and recognize the honorary chairs, Nobel laureate, I'm sorry, Oscar Arias and Ambassador James Jones, and chairman of the Manat Jones Global Strategies, and finally thank uh, the ambassador uh, Albert Ramdin, uh, the assistant secretary general of the OAS, who are hosting us here today. Again, a tremendous applause for all of them. These things don't come together automatically. And unfortunately, we tend to say thank you to people years later when we say how innovative they were. Look at what they, be, what they started. Look at what they set in motion. Yet today is a tremendous part of that motion into the future of the world. Um, I'd like to start off by talking about unaccompanied minors that came to the United States. Last year, thousands of unaccompanied children from Latin America crossed into the United States. Many were fleeing violence, abuse, and persecution in their own country. For most Americans, this exodus marked a shocking introduction to the troubles facing Latin America. For me, it was a stark reminder that as a nation, we must engage with Latin America. The future of their ties ties into our future. Their economics directly impact our own. The challenges they face within their borders easily cross our own. My experience shows that opportunity trumps violence. I was raised by hardworking immigrant parents from Mexico. Uh, my mother, Maria, only made it to the second grade in Mexico. My father, Andres, only made it to the first grade. Yet they reared 11 children here in the United States. And collectively, we've achieved engineering degrees, teaching degrees, master's degrees, doctorate degrees, psychology degrees, in one generation. And yes, me, I was the troublemaker in the family. I became a politician. <laughs> and I made it all the way to Congress, once again in one generation, in a household where English was not the primary language. Spanish was the primary language. And I say that not as an apology, but I say that very proudly. Because what we need to see around the world, as the world gets smaller and smaller, is we need to see and accept and understand that that is a beautiful thing, that is an empowering thing for somebody to be bilingual, trilingual, and so on. In too many households in America, people think that it's cool or okay to utter the words English only. As Kyle mentioned, Arizona far too often has that reputation. For many children in Latin America, particularly in those nations where drug wars are raging, the same atmosphere smothers their opportunities and, in some cases, drives them away from their homeland and away from their dreams. I saw some of my classmates descend into a violent life because they lacked opportunities. It motivated me to find practical, realistic solutions as a legislator in the state of California. For example, as a member of the California State Assembly, I worked to overhaul California's gang prevention and intervention programs. I created and funded the most aggressive juvenile justice law in the country. Now California's juvenile violence and now adult violence has been plummeted. 
not only because of that law, but because that law was actually the spearhead of other laws and creating the synergy that we needed to see to reduce the violence both with our young people and adults in California. And once again, that's what we're doing here today. Today we're creating synergy, continuing the momentum of doing the right thing. As a member of the California State Assembly, I also worked uh, to prevent crime, to make sure that we addressed it in the right way. And for example, in some countries, they think it's the tough fist that gets it done. And unfortunately, they're finding out that that doesn't work. And also, it's very, very expensive. The United States can help the children and the future of Latin America. We can replicate the success we've seen in the United States, but we must expand opportunities by reducing violence. The program that I created in California is now being replicated, not identically, but with the flavor of El Salvador. One of the things that I'm very embarrassed about is the United States Im imports both good things and bad things. We've imported or exported more gang members to Central America than any other country in the world. And that's something that I feel not personally responsible for, but something that I feel responsible to try to curtail and try to correct and to help those countries. And that's why many of my colleagues in Los Angeles go to Central America and they work on those issues. Organizations like USAID, through the Bilateral Merida Initiative, have started this work by improving federal, state, and local government capacity and design in to implement crime prevention initiatives. Public and private sector sources are expanding socioeconomic opportunities for youth in targeted communities. School retention, vocational training, and social integration activities are having an impact as well, a positive impact. Congress must continue funding these programs, but we must do more. We must go above the programs and educate ourselves better regarding our southern neighbors and how we can improve our national interaction with those nations, and it will directly positively benefit our own country by everything that we do. Over several months, I've been meeting with Latin American ambassadors and have seen how increased collaboration is critically and mutually beneficial to all of us. I've seen how Mexico and Colombia served as models for what can be done in the rest of the region through innovative programs with public and private partnerships. For instance, Banco Santander from Mexico has partnered with President Obama's 100,000 Strong in America's Innovation Fund. This program supports grant opportunities on an open and, com and competitive basis to colleges and universities in the Western Hemisphere region. Colombia is a large importer of grains from the United States and exports tropical foods to our country. U.S. cotton yarn and fabric exports to Colombia are used in many apparel items that Colombia exports right back to the United States. Collaboration with Colombia has reduced the pipeline of at-risk youth who fall into the gang world. Since 2001, USAID's assistance to the National Institute for Family Welfare Program has helped more than 5,000 kids with more than 242,000 at-risk children getting help with recruitment prevention programs. Rather than turning into immigration or crime to fund a new, better life, we can help Latin America youth become part of a skilled, educated, employable workforce. It will improve the economic stability of the region while encouraging social well-being and health outcomes. It will also encourage the one thing that is critical to bringing our regions closer together, and that is trade. Wages in Mexico are 37% higher, higher in export-related industries than the rest of its economy. Trade is also good for America. Six million U.S. jobs rely on trade with Mexico, and products made in Mexico contain four times as many U.S.-made parts on average as those made in China. Don't get me started about China. Despite these successes, there is still a lot to be done, especially when it comes to engaging between Latin America and the West Coast. Although we have seen clear examples of how poverty can be reduced through economic growth, there are, there are few anchors in place that will guarantee future collaboration between prosperous, capable, and well-governed partners in the Western Hemisphere. I want California to be a hub for continued innovation with Latin America. It's there, ready for the taking. Now we have to take advantage of it. As a Latino former business owner, I wanted to see Latinos succeed, not only in my community, but throughout the hemisphere. We must break down the barriers that we're currently facing. One of these barriers is the lack of access to adequate funding investment. Another obstacle is small businesses are limited 
with their network access. I want to help expand these networks through roundtables with key industry players so they can discuss specific ways to come together and do business with each other. In the coming weeks and months, I will continue to focus part of my time in Congress on learning from Latin American leaders. Just as importantly, I'll be echoing the lessons I learned by my colleagues. Without understanding the economic and social economic impact we can have on our Latin American neighbors, we will repeat the same failings in the legislative process and as a nation as well. That, le that should lead to our people being shocked by the refugee crisis on our southern borders. With that in mind, I commit to educating my colleagues, breaking down the economic barriers that slow investment here, in La here and also in Latin America, and playing an active role in re-engaging across the Western Hemisphere. One of my immediate enlightenments when I got to Congress was the simplicity of how we're ignoring the over 30 countries to the south of the United States. I mentioned China earlier. When I was on the city council for 10 years, I had business people come up to me and say, I want to go to China. And I would inevitably ask them, that's nice. What interests you in China? They had absolutely no answer. They didn't know why. It's kind of like the old saying in the United States when they used to tell somebody, you want to strike it well in this country? Go west. Nobody knew what was out there. All they knew was something good because everybody says you need to go west. In this country, for too many businesses, for some reason, it became cool and sexy to go to China. Well, I got to say, Sofia Vergara is from Colombia. She's pretty cool and sexy. <laughs> What's wrong with the country south of us? It's not cool and sexy to study abroad in Mexico, in Centro America, South America. But when you hear a student say, well, I'm going to go to Europe, everybody says, that's cool. The thing is, I believe that in our subliminal psyche, for some reason, it's become uncool to hang out with Latinos, to do business with Latinos. With all due respect, I grew up as a child where people actually tried to convince me that I was not cool because I was Latino. And you know what's sad? For far too many years, I believed that. I really did. And it was sad because I wasn't the only one. But because I was able to overcome those lies and just look at the truth for what it was, it wasn't until I was 31 years old when a Latino activist hoodwinked me into running for office. Told me all the good parts, but not the bad parts. But this is the thing that caught my attention. He simply said, Tony, we've never had a Latino represent this 70% Latino community in the state legislature. And because of the term limits, this is going to be our opportunity to do that, and you need to run. And in my heart and in my mind, I did not believe him. I did not believe that I should be the one. Even though in my heart, I knew that diversity is good. I knew that a community that is 7% of one particular community, what's wrong with having somebody they could look up to and say, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So luckily, he was very persuasive, and he convinced me to the detriment of my business and to the lack of being able to see my wife and young children campaigning all the time, we broke that barrier. And then it became cool because then Alex Padilla became a city council member. And then Felipe Fuentes became a state legislature when I got termed out. I moved on to the city council. Nuri Martinez became the first Latina or Latino to ever represent our district which had over 85% of the students, Latino students. And then Raul Bocanegra got elected. And now Alex Padilla is one of the youngest statewide elected officials in California history. And he is our Secretary of State. But had I not taken that step, had I not been convinced that somebody needs to do this, all five of those names that I mentioned, including myself, we all grew up in one zip code where never before had we had somebody elected to high office. Never in the history of that community. And now we have five. And we have a statewide elected official. We have a congressman. Again, the truth was there. The facts were there. The benefits of those actions were staring us in the face. 
But for some reason, subliminally, subconsciously, consciously, we did not want to see it or believe it. And that is my message to all of us today, ladies and gentlemen. The United States and all of the countries south of us should and need to do business with each other. We should and we need to pay attention to each other. It's in our own interests, in our public safety interests, in our economic interests. And I dare say, there's no need to go to China when you have Mexico, Costa Rica, Colombia, Chile. You have so many opportunities of not only stability for countries, but the stability of households that will then create the reality of dreams come true. For so many people who've been convinced that Spanish is not the language of the future, who are convinced that your indigenous roots and your dark skin is not what people want or are looking for. That's a shame if we buy into that and if we in any way permeate that. And I'm here to say, as long as I'm in the United States Congress, this will be my mission to break those barriers, to create those dreams come true for American business people, American citizens, and all the citizens to the south of us. We are the future. We have the resources, natural and otherwise. And one of the things that I'm so, so proud of is with the work ethic of Latinos, we can and should be the dominating region in the world in every sense of the word, with our values and our work ethic and the economics that we can unleash if we do what is right and that is the truth. Let's move forward together. Let's permeate this truth. Let's create this truth and unleash it as it should have been for many, many decades. And let's do it proudly, respectfully, and let the chips fall where they may and let the proof prove itself. Thank you very much.